And yes, so as Nick said already, so I'm going to discuss in my talk what drives domestication. I'm going to draw on a case study from Southwest Asia discussing uh, from an ecological perspective early or the establishment of serial management. And I think historically, as most of us are aware, historically the question what drives domestication would have been answered by a focus on control and domination of humans over animals and plants. And it's very important, this notion is very influential still until today, especially of course in the mainstream media. And it's very important to realize that this notion of control uh, actually derives from a imperial colonial context in 19th century um, Europe where exotic plant and animal species would have been imported into Europe and the social elites literally made contests out of taming animals, taming wild animals and showcasing them uh, in the streets. For example, this is an example of the famous zebra carriage of Lord Walter Rothschild in London. So um, this sort of notion of domestication as being control and domination over nature uh, is, is literally coming from this social uh, historical context, which is of course highly problematic of applying it today and throughout prehistory. And as we already heard uh, earlier today, a couple of scholars since a while challenged this notion of domestication and uh, of, of um, domination and control in domestication relationships. One of the first authors that drew attention and challenged this notion was David Rindos in his famous book, The Origins of Agriculture, where he framed domestication as essentially a co-evolutionary relationship where we need to draw attention also to the domesticates and their own agency and the, the ecology of plants and animals and how they actually interact with humans. Um, and more recently, Marike van der Wien has pioneered, among others, um, in plant agency in archaeobotany and drew attention or challenged the view that we see plants mostly as passive objects in archaeology and archaeobotany um, and suggest that we need to give plants the agency they have and see them as active beings in, in, in human plant relationships. And more recently, last year, in the paper from Bogard et al., where they uh, discuss a reconsider domestication from a process archaeology perspective, uh, we drew attention to or basically dissolve the notion of domestication as sort of like a, a relationship between two species that's focusing on genetic selection towards understanding uh, the networks of interaction between many species in domestication relationships. And that if we want to understand domestication, we literally need to focus on these networks of interaction and how the different species with their own agency influence the co-evolution of all involved um, agents. And this is a sort of newer line of thought and an approach to domestication studies I want to apply today in the case study I want to present. That's a case study where we uh, built an ecological model to better understand uh, the, the origins and the sort of management practices, early management practices of cereals in Southwest Asia. And I'm going to use a body of ecological research that's been recently conducted at the University of Sheffield led by Colin Osborne, Glynis Jones and others um, to interpret our findings and our data. And as I will argue in the talk, um, it will be essential to address plant agency through plant ecological strategies to actually understand and sort of like um, better understand and interpret our findings and our own case study. So for those of you who aren't very familiar with um, the early Neolithic in Southwest Asia, you see here the distribution of sites from which the archaeological evidence is coming from distributed throughout the so-called um, Fertile Crescent. And we're talking about a time frame from the final Pleistocene and then the first uh, millennia of the early Holocene, so roughly 12,000 to 8,000 years before present. And the dominant model for the origins of cereal or cereal and legume management in Southwest Asia is termed the pre-domestication cultivation model. And that is based on two main observations. The first one is illustrated in the graph you see in the upper right. You see in the blue line an increase in the percentage of wild cere or cereal remains in general among archaeobotanical assemblages. And we see a steep increase throughout the late Pleistocene and early Holocene, um, which suggests an increasing focus on cereal exploitation uh, and consumption by these early sedentary communities. The red dashed line indicates the establishment of a central domestication trait that are non-shattering cereal ears, and we see a temporal discrepancy 
that selection for non-shattering uh, only really shows up in the archaeological record about 1.5 to 2,000 years after we see this developing focus on wild cereals. So a major question is, how did people actually exploit these wild cereal habitats? Were they managing them? Were they cultivating them? Were they only gathering? Um, and the conventional answer to that question is that, yes, they were already managing them. It has been suggested that they were already cultivating wild cereals for actually a millennium or more in arable fields based on the finding of or the identification of so-called potential arable weeds at the same site, which indicate disturbance levels that would be indicative of um, tilled soils and the establishment of early arable fields. There are a number of problems with this approach. Uh, the central problem with this approach is that the, it's based on the pure taxonomic identification of potential arable weeds, most of which are identified only to the genus level, not to the species level, which would be more meaningful for the ecology. We can actually not really understand the sort of a fine-tuned development of management practices. And it's more focusing on this traditional distinction between gathering and cultivation. Uh, and we don't see sort of like the, the expected variability in these taxonomic data. So what we've done in our study is we use uh, functional ecology to address more an ecological perspective of uh, the, the change in, in the weed flora associated with cereals to understand from what habitats they've been harvested and what is the ecology of these habitats. And we hope to then also better address questions of how were these stands actually exploited and managed um, over the long term. I'm gonna, so this is the functional ecological model we have constructed. And I'm gonna briefly introduce you to sort of the background, how we did this, what this is actually representing, so you can understand where our conclusions are coming from. Um, you see here a number of samples plotted along a discriminant function, and all these samples represent uh, floristic survey data from non-arable grasslands in Israel and Palestine. They're plotted in white towards the negative end of the axis, and in black, we see samples from arable fields that have been surveyed in the early 20th century by Michael Zowery, so represent a local Arab um, arable system, which is like not mechanized without tractors and animal plowing, for example. And we have used one functional trait to discriminate between non-arable grasslands and arable fields, which is flowering duration. And that is, we've used this because flowering duration is positively associated with uh, agricultural disturbances, predominantly soil tillage, and is measured in the number of months a species is flowering. And using this functional trait, we actually see a, a difference when we see when we look at the discriminant function that the wild cereal habitats, the grasslands plot towards the negative end, the arable fields plot towards the positive end. We have, of course, an overlap, which shows that we have, when we look at disturbance conditions in the southern Levant, an ecological continuum from grasslands to traditionally managed arable fields, which is in itself quite an interesting finding. And we have them because we see a distinction of these different habitats along the discriminant function applied it to early Neolithic archaeobotanical data sets to explore if we see these differences in disturbance also in the early Neolithic. We first applied it to clearly agricultural sites you see here the results for Chatalhögig and Atlidiam. Chatalhögig in uh, the Konya Plain in, in central Anatolia and Atlidiam is actually a submerged site just off the coast of Israel near Haifa. And I'm going to indicate here to better sort of orient in this um, universe of dots and samples the overlap zone in the modern model where you see where wild cereal habitats and tilled arable fields overlap. And we see that the archaebotanical samples from Chatelhuig and Atlidiam plot towards the positive end. They overlap with the samples from and correspond to the, the samples from arable fields. So this shows that we can actually pick up arable disturbance based on archaebotanical samples on, on Neolithic sites. And we have then applied the same model to earlier sites, PPNA sites, which are essential for the pre-domestication cultivation model. So these sites have been hypothesized to represent the, literally the beginnings of arable farming in, the southern, in, in Southwest Asia. That includes Jade and Jeff el Ahma in the middle Euphrates and Native Hakdut uh, in, the, in the lower Jordan Valley. And this is again the overlap zone in the modern model. And we see to our surprise that the, what the archaeobotanical samples from these sites, they're all dominated by wild cereal remains, some of them wild legumes. 
They plot towards the negative end of the function. They overlap with untilled grasslands we surveyed. So we, we think that this indicates that these early sedentary communities did actually harvest these wild cereals and legumes from, at least not from arable fields, but from in some way managed grasslands that would not depend on tillage, on soil tillage and the removal of vegetation to then sow on an annual basis the plants you want to harvest. Which is actually very surprising because when we look at the archaeology of the sites, this is an uh, example, one settlement phase from Jeff al-Ahmar, all these sites have been occupied for centuries. They provide evidence for the large scale exploitation, storage, and also communal preparation of cereals and other food plants. And we know that cereals have been one of the staple foods of these early sedentary communities. So that makes it even more surprising that they're not dependent on an arable system. And of course, it's raising the question. And for us, sort of the main question is to now understand and explain how they were actually managing these wild cereal stands and grasslands without an arable system. Um, and this is where we think it, where plant agency or more precisely the ecological strategies of the cereals themselves are coming into play. And when we think about how these cereal populations could have been managed, it's very important to realize that without any human intervention, when we just look at the distribution of wild cereals in the southern Levant today, where they still occur, we see that they're actually forming very fast and very dense grasslands where they're growing intermixed. So this is an example from just north of the Sea of Galilee in Israel, a stand of where wild emma, barley and oat are growing together in a mixed stand. And these stands are normally as dense as a cultivated cereal field, which has been mentioned um, very often. And it has been suggested that early cultivation would literally mimic a wild cereal stand and work with the ecology of wild cereals instead of sort of you know, against it, um, how it would have been suggested earlier in domestication studies. These very dense stands only develop, of course, if a certain intensity of grazing is excluded. This is one of the major factors today that restricts the distribution of these dense wild cereal stands. So thinking about um, early cereal management, it would have been essential to exclude grazers in the landscape from the plots you want to harvest later to assure a high density um, if, if you're not dependent on an arable system. And then thinking about how can these cereals actually by themselves form these very dense stands, which would be from their structure comparable to a zone, um, to a cereal, to a managed cereal field, a first important observation is that they're actually synanthropes. So they are annual, they're all annual species that are principally adapted to disturbance, also to human disturbances, and would be abundant around um, around habitation and, and human settlements, and um, which is principally, it's comparable to, for example, a commensal strategy of, for example, rodents or the commensal pathway into domestication relationships uh, of, of yeah, commensal like rodents or wolves, for example. A second very essential trait, which makes the cereals very um, strong competitors is that they have large grains. The large grains, due to their size, they germinate more rapidly then smaller seeded species and they produce larger seedlings, which are very competitive and have sort of like a starting advantage in their growth over other species. And the large grains and the resulting large seedlings explain how cereals can actually dominate the grasslands in which they're growing and form these very dense stands and outcompete other species, which is of course also helpful in thinking about sowing cereals into an agricultural field and is one of the main mechanisms why these wild cereals actually have been enter the close domestication relationship instead of other species in Southwest Asia. And the third very important and very interesting feature is the uh, mechanism of how cereals bring their dispersal units, the spikelets into the soil, and all the, all the, um, the spikelets which contain, contain the grains of the different cereal species have mechanisms to penetrate very thick vegetation layers and to actually bury this uh, the, the grains in this spikelet into the soil to protect it from predation, from fires, etc., to let it germinate, uh, which is also one of the mechanisms why you don't necessarily need to remove competing vegetation until the soil in order to sow grains um, to start to manage cereals. So from this point of view, it becomes clear that a pre-arable or no-tillage no cereal management system would actually have depended on the strategies of the cereals, the ecological strategies, together with the strategies of humans, which would 
mainly focused on enhancing and ensuring the growth and the abundance of cereals and to ensure their long-term um, availability as an, a resource they can harvest. And so answering the question of what drives domestication, I think it becomes increasingly clear when we bring plant agency and ecological strategies into uh, the picture that plants, in this case, wild cereals would have contributed to entering and driving this relationship as much as the human communities would have done. Thank you very much.